The following program is sponsored by Oakland Zoo. There's more going on in there than you can even appreciate. And I think when you look in the eyes, you begin to realize that, that they're not just looking at you, they're actually thinking. And there's a whole another world in there that we can't even appreciate. They're important to each one of us, even those of us who haven't seen them in the wild, because they're, you know, they're in our storybooks from when we're, from when we're children. They're so big, they're so awe-inspiring, they're so like us, and yet they're so mysteriously different. The world's largest living land mammal is a sight to behold. They can grow to be an astounding 14 feet tall and weigh 14,000 pounds, or, in other words, the same weight as seven Volkswagens. But as beautiful, solid, and sturdy as they are, elephants are standing on shaky ground. In 10 years, certain populations of elephants um, will have gone extinct. And unfortunately, their study showed that if we don't do something within the next three to five years, we could potentially see no more forest elephants. We could basically see the extinction of forest elephants. And pretty quickly after that, we're looking at the extinction of savanna elephant. You know, it's huge, huge losses we've been looking at over the last few years, and we have to stop it. Centuries of slaughter for their coveted ivory tusks have left many elephant populations hanging on by a thread or gone completely. Really a big, large-scale loss. At this point, if we don't do something and do it quickly, uh, we could be the generation that made the elephant go extinct in the wild. They are deep thinkers, able to feel joy and grief, and there's so much more to learn about them. We're discovering new things about elephants all the time. And at that time I just said, you know, oh my God, elephants experience grief and gratitude, just like us. Their very existence is threatened. We're still losing many, many thousands of elephants a year across the continent, and it, it's not looking like it's changing fast. But there is hope. A band of champions around the world is fighting so that elephants will survive and thrive. We cannot sleep on the job. We have to keep calling in more people, all hands on deck, to save elephants, all hands on deck. And it's very important to me to be an elephant advocate just because of what a magnificent animal it is and the tremendous crisis they're now going through in the wild. I think the uh, efforts of the entire world should focus on protecting African elephants in the wild uh, from the poaching that's going on so that we don't lose them. From Kenya to California, from researchers working with pencils to rangers enforcing with guns, the battlegrounds are vast and various. The courthouse, the marketplace, the African savannas. But their cause is the same, to save the elephant and the stakes have never been higher. In the wild, elephants are surprisingly social creatures. The family unit of an elephant is critical because it's really what they've evolved to be. The best-known free-range elephant population in the world is in Amboseli National Park on the Kenya-Tanzania border in Africa. The park is teeming with wildlife, wildebeest, zebra, jackal, cheetah, and over 1,200 elephants. In the 150-square-mile park, elephants roam freely and are relatively undisturbed by poachers. The park is home to the Amboseli Elephant Research Project, Launched in 1972, it's the longest running study of elephant behavior in the world. Family units are about cooperation and care and support. And so even for the males that will grow independent and leave that unit, that early life experience is really important for later life success. And what's amazing about family units is that although they're usually about maternal relationships, so it's usually kin relationships, sometimes it's just about friendships and what you'll find is that even closely related individuals 
they don't like each other and they don't agree on strategies, they'll, they'll form separate family units. And sometimes totally unrelated animals form a family unit. Dr. Joyce Poole is very familiar with Amboseli. As one of the world's most renowned elephant experts, she has studied the social behavior of these creatures for over four decades. Dr. Poole has made great strides in learning how elephants talk to each other. I really love elephants. Elephants are, are very social animals. Um, they're interacting all the time, whether it's uh, in huge, you know, dramatic display of emotion and affection or, or hostility, um, or very, very subtly. Elephants live in matriarch societies. Families rely on the lead female's knowledge and protection to keep them alive. Elephants have an extraordinary uh, repertoire of behavior, which is what I study. Um, We've documented over 200 different postures and gestures that have meaning to other elephants. They have over 37 different vocalizations that they use. Some of these behaviors are very dramatic, like the mating pandemonium, when a female is mated and the whole family gets excited and rumbles and trumpets, or when a baby elephant is born, the kind of uh, drama that goes on in the family, screaming and rumbling and trumpeting and roaring and touching the baby. How elephants interact with their habitat really has an impact on other species. Another very active organization in the park is the Abacelli Trust for Elephants, or AT. The AT research project is currently tracking about 1,600 elephants that are the core of the Amboseli region, over thousands of square kilometers. Dr. Vicky Fishlock and Katito Sayalel help the Amboseli Trust monitor over 3,000 elephants. I started to fall in love with elephants when I was a little girl. I've been studying elephants for the last 21 years. The Amboseli Trust for Elephants help also the community. I pay them and ask them questions where they've been seeing the elephant. Then they follow outside the park and as we, we monitor them inside the park, although sometimes also as we go outside the park. Elephants are loaded with useful features. Their large ears help them communicate from great distances. Their massive yet elastic feet are built to move easily through mud. They smell, breathe and drink with the trunk. And then there's the tusks. Elephant tusks grow throughout their life and they can weigh over 200 pounds each. They are modified teeth and are used to dig, move things and to make contact with each other. Tusks are made out of ivory, a very dense form of bone. Ivory is strong, very beautiful and it's coveted by humans who are willing to kill an entire elephant just for its tusks. In the 1900s, shooting an elephant was a sign of manliness for wealthy Westerners. Ivory was used for everything from brushes to piano keys, and an ivory frenzy was born. The world developed a major taste for ivory. By 1913, the U.S. was consuming 200 tons of ivory every year, and the global elephant population began to decline. The major reason for the diminishing numbers right now is the demand for ivory and the consequent killing of elephants. 
Why do people buy ivory? And I think it's cultural. Until I left Sri Lanka, I had no sensibility about elephants being captured from their mothers, about being ch chained, about their spirits being broken. It's similar in China, in Thailand, in other places where people buy ivory. Culture is a powerful, powerful motivator. Once coveted only by wealthy elites, ivory became popular with a larger demographic, the middle class, especially in China, who collected ivory trinkets, religious statues and ornaments. Ivory can be found in San Francisco uh, along Fisherman's Wharf, in Chinatown, in flea markets, in, uh, in, in stores that sell artifacts and carvings. But none of these practices have any more place in our culture, in our world. It's time for them to go, and it's time for us all to accept that they need to go. Throughout the 1900s, world desire for ivory continued, and more and more elephants were slaughtered to feed the demand. The effects of elephant slaughter go beyond the immediate loss of an individual elephant. The death can cause a ripple effect in that elephant's family. When a matriarch is lost, very often the family will split. It's like the matriarch is kind of the glue that holds a family together. Once a family is split, um, the calves in that family have, have a lower chance of survival themselves. The poaching is having a big impact, of course, on the ones who are killed, but it also has a, a really enormous impact on the survival of the remaining members. Dr. Poole's findings made waves. In 1989, conservationists urged Kenya's president to destroy the country's stockpile of ivory. Within a year, ivory trade was banned internationally. At first, the ban worked. Ivory demand in the US dropped to a historic low, and elephant populations began to rebound. But the international ban wasn't bulletproof. Two sanctioned lapses, one in 1999 and another in 2008, allowed for illegal trade to spike, and elephant populations began to decline more rapidly than ever. Domestic trade is still possible. The United States, for the most part, restricted the sale of ivory. However, there were clauses and exemptions to both the federal regulations and the California regulations. So, for example, you could buy antique ivory, or you could buy ivory that was pre-1975 or 1976, given if it met certain criteria. If, and if, if there's laws with loopholes and exemptions, it becomes uh, convoluted and difficult to enforce. Today, 30 to 40,000 elephants are poached every year. An elephant is killed every 15 minutes. Between 2010 and 2012, nearly 100,000 were killed. Researching the elephants themselves has made a dramatic impact on conservation efforts, but other groups have made tremendous progress by researching the other side of the equation, humans. Big Life was founded in 2010 to directly address the dramatic escalation of poaching in Africa. We have a total of, of, of 31 different teams operating over that area. Some are vehicle based, some are mobile with camping equipment, some are based themselves on hills overlooking uh, big areas where they, where they observe with binoculars and night vision equipment. Uh, but the majority of, of the units are based out of small four to eight, eight ranger um, teams who will each day go out, patrol the areas, look for any signs of poaching. It didn't take long for Big Life to make a big difference. Within months of its inception, the organization had established 12 anti-poaching outposts and had broken up the worst of the poaching gangs operating in the park. Since 2010, Big Life's teams have facilitated over a thousand poaching arrests and confiscated over 3,000 weapons. Big Life sports a staff of over 300 rangers and scouts. They manage 30 outposts and a network of informants, equipment, and tracker dogs to stop poachers. As the members of Big Life have discovered, connecting with local communities near Amboseli has proven to be key. And they're not the only ones building bridges between locals and elephants and empowering both. I've been working in wildlife conservation 
for as long as I can remember, 20 plus years. Winnie Kiru realized that with the increase in population in Kenya, natural wildlife migratory routes and habitats were being disrupted. Wild animals, including elephants, were finding fields of crops and destroying them. To save animals, you have to work hand in hand with the community. We expect so much from the communities and it is only fair that we bring them into the conservation equation in an equitable, participatory way that makes them feel that they are equal stakeholders in conservation. With her group, Conservation Kenya, Winnie empowers the local farmers near Amboseli to protect their farms and their livelihood. When an elephant coat goes through and slops away a watermelon farm, clears out the tomato farm, picks out the corn from <laughs> just the day before harvest, it makes human elephant conflict a very personal thing because it's impacting people who cannot afford to take any challenge. They are very, very vulnerable. So fences are good. Teaching people how to keep elephants out of the farms is a good thing, but still we need to recognize that the level of vulnerability for a peasant farmer is so high. The ability to absorb risk is so low that we have to be really creative with giving them alternatives or presenting compensation or insurance schemes, there has to be some way, something to fall back on. As the remaining free-range elephants roam the African savannas, in the United States, organizations are working in tandem to educate the public, a critical component in raising awareness to support and save the elephants. At the Oakland Zoo, young visitors experience an elephant in person for the very first time. I think the thing that really struck me with elephants at the beginning was uh, how unique they are and how majestic they are, just in both their size uh, and power. But then over time it became uh, how emotionally sensitive they were to have a family group like they do. They're also so unique because of how intelligent they are and how socially complex they are. And it just puts together for a really tremendous species to be able to work with. The zoo doesn't just show off elephants for fun, it's part of a bigger mission. The only real reason to have zoo, uh, elephants in captivity is to provide a chance to educate the public, raise awareness for conservation, and then go that, that final step and really provide conservation for elephants in the wild. Uh, and so we advocate them, for them politically. Uh, we uh, provide the, the best animal welfare we can possibly provide. We provide them with enough space and the appropriate weather. We provide them with the quality of nutrition that we should. So when you really put all the educational pieces in there, uh, as well as the uh, animal care, it's that complete program that you don't find very uh, many other places in the world. Challenging the economics of the ivory trade takes tremendous resource. People can fight to save elephants with money, with politics, or with their voices. This is the annual March for Elephants in San Francisco. I see a creature who knows how to forage when there are droughts 
I see a creature who can smell water 10 or more feet underneath her feet. I see a, a creature who can communicate in, 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 in infrasound below 20 hertz, below human, the capacity of human hearing. When I first started advocating at that time, it was very minimally, you know, Facebook posts, talking to people, um, drawing people into conversations about the issue. But then I soon realized that more needed to be done. I think we need to bring this issue of, of rampant poaching, or elephants and other creatures disappearing from our planet within a generation. We need to bring it to the table as a social justice issue, as an issue that deserves marching on the streets. This annual event is just one of a national network of marches whose mission is to raise awareness to the epidemic of ivory poaching. The focus of the march is both to bring people together about this, to raise awareness, but it goes beyond that. We had a large turnout both in San Francisco and elsewhere, and whether more people are aware about the crisis because of this, the answer to that question is yes, I sincerely hope so. But you know, I want to see thousands of people. I don't want to see just 2,000 people. I would like to see 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people. Another U.S. champion of elephants is the Wildlife Conservation Society, which estimates that 96 elephants are killed every day in Africa. Hence the name of their campaign, 96 Elephants. We need to do three things. One is uh, stop the killing of the elephants, stop the trafficking in the ivory, and stop the demand. And what 96 Elephants is trying to do is really tackle all three. The bottom line is that kids, they're the ones that are gonna suffer. They're the ones that are not gonna have elephants in their lives. And we have a responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. In California, a loophole in the state ban allowed ivory to be bought and sold as long as it was originally obtained before 1977. The WCS and the Oakland Zoo helped draft a state bill that would close that loophole. In February 2015, Oakland Zoo President Dr. Joel Parrott and head elephant keeper Gina Kinsley traveled to Sacramento to push for the passing of AB 96. In October 2015, Elephant Conservation has scored a major victory when California Governor Jerry Brown signed AB 96 into law. The bill makes it illegal for anyone to sell nearly any kind of elephant ivory in the state. It's fantastic when politics starts to pay attention to an issue because it mobilizes resources. Increased regulation in the states is encouraging, but the U.S. ranks a distant second in ivory markets. By far, most ivory trade, upwards of 80%, is conducted in China. One thing that would have a huge impact is on the demand side in China. Uh, if they really took steps to, to crack down on their, their ivory trade within the country, and, and there are signs that hopefully in time they'll do that, but they could, they, they could wipe out a lot of the, the trade and a lot of the demand very quickly. It's difficult to predict how many elephants there will be in 10 years and much of that depends on what happens with the ivory trade, whether we're able to get the demand for ivory under control or not. Will all these efforts be enough to save the elephant? It is true that in 10 years certain populations of elephants um, will have gone extinct. The populations can become so fragmented and so small that they don't, they no longer play that important ecological role. Though they span various countries, languages and specific objectives, the many members of the Elephant Initiative share a common overarching mission, to support the elephants in the wild, in sanctuary and in captivity. Their story is our story because how we treat elephants is a reflection on ourselves. It needs everyone, all the way from people out here in Africa to those sitting, sitting at home, and, and, and each person doing their small thing to, to, to bring this whole, this whole ivory, ivory trade down. Hope lies in the fact that now we are seeing a world that is coming together. The forces that keep coming up against elephants are strong and relentless. We cannot sleep on the job.
we have to keep calling in more people, all hands on deck, to save elephants, all hands on deck. We could be the generation that sees the extinction of the elephant in the wild. Is that our legacy? Is that the legacy that we want? And I'll tell you right now, it's in our hands. We can make a difference if we all band together and work together here in California and across the country. We can stop this crisis. We have the tools. It's in our hands. And as it always does, change starts with the actions of the individual. It's incumbent upon us to be leaders uh, in the political effort to ban the ivory trade. Don't buy ivory and get the word out. Stop the ivory trade, close it down. People can donate, certainly, to organizations that are trying to set land aside. I obviously think that we need to save elephants. I think that elephants are amazing and that's why I live here in Kenya and why I work on them and why I went to university for a long time to get the degrees in order to do this kind of work. And I think they need saving because they're special and incredible. But more than that, elephants are a huge part of the ecosystems that they occupy. They are an umbrella species. If you meet the needs of elephants, you're meeting the needs of all kinds of other animals. They're a keystone species because if you take elephants out of an ecosystem, it changes a huge amount of things. Taking action within your own state, supporting groups lobbying against the ivory trade is important. People that are able to provide funding resources to, to organizations operating across Africa is hugely important. Every dollar they put towards elephant conservation, they are putting it to the heart of the matter. Do I want to be the generation that sees the extinction of this incredible animal? Do I want to have to look at my child and say it was my fault, it was our fault? And I feel that I have a greater responsibility working for a conservation organization. Uh, we have the responsibility to lead, and if we don't lead, then shame on us. What do you see when you look in the eyes of an elephant? I see an intelligence that you don't see looking at anything else. You, you, you see a, an animal looking back at you and interpreting you and your behavior. When you look at an elephant, the elephant is also looking at you. Ideally, not with fear or disdain, but as a fellow living, breathing being. For we are all connected as animals on Earth.